Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional and international headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On today's show, we speak with Michael Collar, the Deputy Director General of the European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations, to ask what the future holds for the millions of Ukrainians forced to flee their country due to the war with Russia. Whether Europe's treatment of them versus refugees from the Middle East exposes racism, double standards and hypocrisy. And if the EU plans to pull funding from the crisis in Syria, Yemen or Palestine in order to make up the humanitarian aid gap. Michael, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, let's begin with the story in the main headlines, the war between Russia and Ukraine. Now, Ukrainian refugees, despite being called in the Western media civilised and able to integrate in Western societies, continue to suffer at a shocking rate. Tell me, frankly speaking, has the EU done enough to support Ukraine? Um, are you speaking about Ukraine or speaking about the Ukrainian refugees coming to into the EU territory right now? Well, a uh, little, think, a little of both. <laughs> right. Well, um, this is a, a huge refugee crisis. That's clear. Uh, at this moment in time, we have already about 5.3 million Ukrainians coming into the European Union. Um, some of them are also in Moldova, which is not a part of the European Union, but a neighboring country. Uh, and obviously, um, due to the generosity of the population, these people are being welcomed, uh, let's say, a little bit everywhere, especially in Poland, in Germany, uh, and in Italy, where you have big Ukrainian communities anyway. So uh, there are no refugee camps. Uh, people usually uh, gain uh, places, come to places where they have family members, where they have uh, people that they know, and therefore the absorption, if you allow me to use that term, of uh, uh, Ukrainians in uh, the European member states uh, works relatively smoothly. Uh, now, for Ukraine proper, I think it is important to, to see that not only is there war, of course, in the east of Ukraine and the south of Ukraine, but there are also many more internally displaced persons in Ukraine than refugees out of Ukraine into the European Union. We're speaking uh, about uh, uh, 7.5 to 8 million people that are in Ukraine internally displaced. And therefore, we have now a population that uh, amounts to about one fourth of the total population of Ukraine that is in need of assistance because they have to leave their homes. Well, it's interesting you say that many EU nations have welcomed Ukrainian refugees with open arms. I saw comments from the Bulgarian Prime Minister, Kirill Petkov, who said recently, these are not the refugees we are used to. These people are Europeans, intelligent, educated people. This is not the refugee wave we've been used to, people we were not sure about their identity, who could have even been terrorists. Should countries be allowed to choose refugees based on race, religion or politics? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, uh, and I think Europe cannot be accused for not welcoming uh, refugees in millions and millions uh, over the past years. I think the only difference that I probably see is that uh, refugees from Ukraine have, um, uh, on the basis of a decision of um, the European Ministers of Interior, immediately been granted work permits. But apart from that, uh, the treatment is not different from refugees from other parts of the world. And I remember, for example, the arrival of the Syrians and Iraqis in 2015 and 16, where we had, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, slightly, in the beginning, slightly comparable numbers of, of refugees. Um, it is quite clear um, that the, the law applies to all, and we have uh, laws in order to uh, settle the situation of refugees. These are based uh, on the Fourth Geneva Convention, they are based on international agreements, and there's absolutely no difference between a refugee uh, or an asylum seeker from an African nation, from a Middle Eastern nation, or from Ukraine. It is, however, uh, of course, normal that um, if you are the direct neighbor of a country that is in the situation Ukraine finds itself in, then of course there is perhaps a slightly bigger emotion, there's a slightly bigger um, uh, readiness of private persons to help. 
But we have seen the same same thing in uh, in other scenarios. Well, I'm going to have to disagree with you there because the way Syrians were welcomed some time ago was certainly extremely different. Now, you studied Islamic and Middle Eastern studies. Do you think these comparisons are fair? And why were other Middle Eastern refugees, such as those from Syria, not received with the same warm welcome? Well, no, no, I'm not quite in agreement with, with your analysis of the situation. If you remember uh, the situation in, uh, for example, the summer 2015, and I'm a German citizen, and my country, uh, the million Syrians that uh, poured into the country, coming over the Balkans, uh, going through Hungary, were very well, very much welcome. We even invented a new German word for that, which is uh, translated into English as the welcome culture. Now, this was a phenomenon. And obviously, um, it is not quite uh, uh, fair in a way to compare the welcome that now Ukrainians are receiving two months into the Ukrainian crisis with uh, the uh, situation of other refugees that have been in Europe for four years, five years, six years or seven years and where certain problems have, uh, have arisen. Uh, what we see in the case of You've Ukraine, just said a couple of minutes ago that the welcome has not been different. And now you're saying it's not fair to compare the welcome that was received. So which one is it? No, I mean, the welcome uh, for Syrians in 2015 was enthusiastic in my country, for example. And the same thing is true for Ukrainians right now. Uh, the question is, what happens after five, six, seven years? We are absolutely not yet there in the Ukrainian crisis. But, uh, you know, you, you, I think it's a very general phenomenon. If you think, for example, of the uh, situation of Syrians that find themselves in Jordan, um, in the beginning, there were mainly Syrians coming from the south of Syria, for example, from the Dara region, and they just went over the border. They went into Ramtha, they went to Mafraq, they went into the towns of northern Jordan, where, you know, very often there were people uh, that were close to them, parts of their families and so forth. And obviously the welcome was very, very uh, accordion. After six, seven years, of course, there are more problems that arise from the fact that now, for example, there is an additional pressure on the natural resources of this region and so forth. So structurally, this is, uh, I think, a very well-known phenomenon. Often in refugee crisis, in the first months, in the first year, refugees are very cordially welcomed by the host population. But then after some years, there are also some objective problems that arise that unfortunately lead sometimes to populist reactions. But uh, really, uh, we shouldn't take the statements of this or that individual politician as the kind of policy line of European member states and of the European Union. Uh, politicians can voice their personal opinions, but this doesn't mean that the legal order that settles the way how refugees are welcomed, which kind of uh, support they receive and so forth, that this would be changed. And there, uh, I think uh, we can take pride in the fact that the European Union is a community of law. There are laws that apply and laws that apply also when it comes to supplying assistance and granting, uh, granting uh, uh, the right to stay in the European Union to people who are in need and these are refugees. OK, well, let's talk a little bit about the UK and a major deal that has been announced there. Now, last month, Priti Patel said that Britain's deal to remove illegal migrants to Rwanda would be a blueprint for other EU countries to follow. Now, the UNHCR has called the proposal unacceptable and a breach of international law. How do you see this proposal? Do you think it's a fair solution for countries who are struggling with rising numbers of illegal immigrants? Well, I mean, uh, you don't really want me to comment on uh, uh, UK policy. The European uh, Union, uh, unfortunately, doesn't count the United Kingdom any longer as one of its member states. But one thing is for sure, we have a principle by which returns always have to be safe, they have to be dignified, they have to be sustainable, and they have to be voluntary. Uh, we cannot return uh, people into uh, insecure situations. And by the way, even if there is a court ruling, that a person uh, would have to quit the EU territory because it was found that, for example, the claim for asylum was not legally justified, such a person would be returned only if it doesn't uh, lead to, let's say, personal uh, lack of security, uh, personal hardship, for example, the menace of, uh, of uh, torture or of uh, uh, life penalty. Uh, there are numerous cases where people uh, have lost their status uh, as uh, um, or their, 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 their kind of right to stay in the long haul, but then they are to tolerated because uh, removing them and bringing them back to her home country would uh, be a case of hardship. So um, there, there are clear rules in that regard. 
Well, the UK isn't the only country considering this. Denmark has been in talks with Rwanda for a couple of years about a similar topic. Patel has said she'd be happy to work on the same kind of deal with other EU countries in the future, saying it would give them strength in numbers. So is the EU planning to approach the UK for advice anytime soon? To my best knowledge, not at all. And so what are your thoughts on the wider deal in general? Obviously, the UK is no longer you know, part of the um, EU thanks to Brexit. But what is your personal feeling as an expert on humanitarian aid and refugees? Do you think this is a fair and just solution? Well, um, you know, what the first thing that you learn when you work in humanitarian aid is that you have to look at individual solutions. You don't uh, come with blunt uh, statements or blunt solutions. You have to look at the situation of you and me when we are refugees not uh, our group, not our clan, not our people, not our region. Uh, uh, if you have a right uh, of asylum, it is your right because you're personally persecuted. So that has to be looked at. And that is, by the way, why we have individual procedures, not procedures that uh, would, for example, uh, as such, uh, grant a certain status to a certain kind of population. And then you can uh, figure out uh, where, for example, in which cases after after conflict has uh, stabilized, the conflict has ended, maybe the conditions are right to return. But uh, by and large, um, I think in every single crisis that has happened in the world over the past 20 years, and where uh, scores of people then came as refugees of Euro uh, to the European Union, it is fair to say that um, uh, very large parts of this uh, refugee population ultimately hasn't always stayed in Europe. For example, you don't have an active conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina any longer, and still many of the Bosniaks who left um, their home country in the 90s are still uh, residing in the European Union. The same thing is true for the Syrians. The same thing is uh, true for many Afghans who've left, for example, in the, in the 80s uh, when the Taliban took the power for the first time. So, um, you know, th this again has to be looked at uh, conflict from conflict, person to person uh, in an individual way. Um, and let's not forget that uh, there are many economies in the European Union we're actually quite grateful uh, to receive uh, people from other countries because the labor market situation, because the demographic situation are such that uh, they would like uh, to have uh, new uh, citizens, new people living in the country, new people contributing to the economy. So I think one has to look at the situation with the level of granularity. And even the public reaction to immigration is different from member state to member state. There are member states that uh, at this moment in time are rather sensitive to more immigration, but there are others that are welcoming refugees with open arms. So let's look at it with a level of granularity. Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. The EU is not going to be asking Ms. Patel for advice at any time in the near future. Well, let's shift our attention to Syria. We've mentioned it a few times so far. Now, uh, very recently in a tweet, you said that the EU won't let Syria down, and yet the EU has consistently done that. Do you believe that with Ukraine now taking the spotlight, the tragedies that have been committed by the Assad regime have now been forgotten? No, they have not been forgotten. And actually, um, I tweeted indeed um, yesterday when sharing part of the ministerial meeting uh, on Syria and the region that we are hosting here in Brussels for the sixth time already, starting in 2017. This is the annual meeting of uh, the international community, um, not only Western nations, but the international community, for example, Iran was present yesterday, where we look at the plight of the Syrian people and where we put money together. If possible, also discuss uh, political solutions. Unfortunately, the political solutions uh, advance uh, at a much lower pace than uh, the international aid effort. Obviously, we have the Geneva process, we have the United Nations uh, Special Representative, we have the Constitutional Committee and so forth. Uh, this is unfortunately not um, a system that produces uh, quick solutions for, I think, the political reasons that we all know. But yesterday, we uh, put together, the international community put together a record pledge, 6.4 billion euros, uh, mostly in rent money for 2022-2023, which is uh, half a billion more than the equivalent pledge of last year. So what this tells us is that there is no fatigue in the international community when it comes to assisting Syrians. Syrians in Syria that need assistance, but also, of course, Syrians in Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan and Iraq and many other countries. Uh, the donors are there. There is no donor fatigue uh, and the international organizations are mobilized. 
Um, well, you say so there's far, no donor fatigue, but certainly I think the UN has come out and said that, uh, that a record number of people around the world are going to need humanitarian aid. There's been huge pressure on humanitarian funds at the start of the year. I'd have to disagree with that. It feels like there has been donor fatigue. There's been the COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine as well, a big spotlight as well. How can you say there's no donor fatigue when all the humanitarian agencies uh, are saying that they're running out of money? No, I, uh, there is no donor fatigue with respect to mobilizing money for Syrians. That's what I said, and I think it's proven. At the same time, I would say there is uh, donor insufficiency. You know, uh, if you look at the money, the amount of money that's mobilized every year for humanitarian aid, you see an increase of money. For example, my own organization is increasing its, uh, its own uh, humanitarian aid effort from 21 to 27 by about 35%. The problem is only that this is totally outpaced by the needs, because every year we have more crises. The existing crises, unfortunately, don't go away, and the number of people that are suffering from this uh, are increasing. On top of that, uh, COVID and now uh, also the, the war in Ukraine have led to a situation whereby the crisis would may become more expensive. If you look, for example, at what it takes to finance the food basket of an average Yemeni, you will see that over the past three or four months, the price that uh, the World Food Program, for example, has to uh, bring together, the money that they have to bring together to, to feed Yemenis, uh, has risen by about 25 to uh, 30 percent in only two months. And this is because of the situation in the world food market after the Russian attack against uh, Ukraine. So it becomes more expensive. And that means we need to have more money. Now, need more money means not only that donors have to give more. It also means that new donors have to come on board. So far, you have only about six or seven major donors of humanitarian aid in the world. Um, if I take the United States and the European Union, we together represent already more than 50% of worldwide humanitarian aid. So where are the others? So where do we fill the gap in all of that? If you're saying we need more donors, we need more money, where do we fill the gap? Is the EU prepared to do that? Well, uh, I think it needs to be a mixture of elements. First we need to have more donors. And I start at home. In the European Union, we have 27 member states, but only five or six of these member states have sizable humanitarian aid programs. We have to bring in also the other 22 member states of the European Union. Who specifically? Uh, who needs to step up specifically country-wise as part of the EU? Well, let me put it that way. Um, uh, the, uh, let's say, most generous donors in the European Union, you find in the northwest of the European Union. That's basically the Scandinavian countries, Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Um, if you go to the south and to the east of the European Union, there is still some room for improvement. And uh, countries know this because we discuss with them, with the governments about this, and they're making efforts, but of course, uh, this has to be accelerated. Uh, but you have to go also beyond the European Union. Uh, look at the clubs of rich countries. For example, um, the OECD countries. There are, I think, 38 members of OECD or the G20, which uh, bring together uh, uh, industrial, but also rising nations. Not all of these countries uh, have already started to uh, deliver humanitarian aid. Some do, but uh, let's say not uh, very much uh, consistently. For example, there is a year where they may put a lot of money on the table, and other years they, they are a little bit more uh, uh, scarce with their resources. Huh? Okay, so you're saying we do need more funds, we need more donors as well. But the big issue can be once we have the humanitarian aid, how it actually gets to where it's needed most. Now, Russia has hinted at vetoing the renewing of the mandate that allows the UN to use the Bab al Hawa crossing when it expires very soon on the 9th of July. So how will the EU deliver the aid to Syrians, given that if it goes through Damascus, the aid will be under the control of the regime? Well, first, in Syria, we use every form of uh, bringing the aid to the people that we can find. Uh, as you say, uh, rightly, cross-border cooperation is absolutely necessary. I mean, there are between 800 and 1,000 trucks that go into the northwest of Syria through Bab al Hawa every month. If that Bab al-Hawa was closed, there would be a huge supply problem. And we have seen what it means already in the northeast of Syria, where, of course, uh, we have no more internationally recognized cross, uh, crossing point that the United Nations could use. At the same time, however, we are also very much in favor of cross-line cooperation. So we have no problem with uh, bringing aid from Damascus to the northeast, for example, or the northwest. 
Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, happening only at the at small scale, which has to do with political, but also with logistical problems. In as much as this is possible, we would support that. And of course, um, one has to take uh, protective uh, measures against aid diversion. Humanitarian aid, according to the EU, uh, EU system, is always delivered through specialized partners, never through governments. So delivering aid, for example, in the part of Syria that is um, controlled by uh, the authorities in Damascus, doesn't mean to give money to the Assad government. It is implemented uh, through specialized organizations, NGOs, UN um, uh, agencies, and so forth. Um, and uh, for that, we have monitoring. Things. We have audits. We have um, independent audits by third parties. Uh, we have our offices on the ground. ECHO has an office in Damascus that can monitor what's going on. And as soon as there is uh, the kind of suspicion of diversion of aid, we stop. We stop, we inquire, and we only resume aid once um, we are sufficiently, uh, let's say, uh, reassured about the way the aid is implemented. So this is something which is not specific to the Syrian situation. We, we have, of course, the same problems in many, many crisis uh, theaters. But in Syria, uh, there's a different uh, degree of politicization, which uh, makes us even more uh, careful in, how, in the way how aid is implemented. Okay, so we could see more uh, focus, more pressure for the uh, the route from the Nile. Let's talk about other refugees in desperate needs of some of these funds, Palestine. Now, the UN has warned this month that more than five and a half million Palestinian refugees may no longer have access to basic services like food, education, health care, due to a drop in financing from UN member states. And in particular, and I quote, a stark drop in EU funding. In such a volatile region, can we really afford to have another crisis? Absolutely not. And uh, actually, uh, humanitarian aid funding for Syrian, uh, sorry, for Palestinian uh, refugees has stopped at, uh, stopped at no point. Uh, we concentrate uh, our assistance right now on Gaza and on uh, Area C in the West Bank. But obviously, um, there are Palestinians in Syria, there are Palestinians in Lebanon, there are Palestinians in Jordan, and many other countries. Uh, we support UNRWA and uh, we, we continue our assistance. What has stopped um, uh, for uh, a, let's say, interim period for a short while uh, is not humanitarian aid, but our um, direct uh, financial transfers that EU development assistance is making available for the benefit of the Palestinian National Authority. Uh, and this is not a stop for good, but this is about uh, agreeing to a certain number of conditions under which this money would be uh, made available. So I would like to make a very clear distinction there between our humanitarian effort that goes on unabatedly and is actually being increased and this uh, financial uh, contribution to salaries uh, uh, that are under the control of the Palestinian Authority where still some negotiations have to be uh, brought to, to a happy end. Well, obviously, big concerns there about the UNRWA closing down. Now, their former spokesman, Chris Gunner, said this month that even if the body, who has supported Palestinian refugees for more than 70 years, even if they do close down, it won't mean that Palestinian refugees and the right of return will magically evaporate. So what is the EU's position on the right of return? And what, in your opinion, is the solution to this issue? Well, I, I think you know, you know that the European Union has a, a principled position in this regard. Uh, we stand still behind the two-state solution. Uh, we want a negotiated solution between the parties. Uh, we um, see um, uh, occupation of uh, Palestine uh, as something that has to be brought to an end uh, in accordance with relevant United Nations resolutions uh, uh, on the basis of bilateral negotiations that we are uh, ready to incentivize and to support as much as possible. The European Union since 1996 has uh, special envoys to offer our good services in this context, together with the envoys of other countries and international players. Um, our special envoy, Mr. Kopans, has just traveled in the region, has met uh, the Palestinian, but also um, Israeli and Lebanese authorities and so forth. And we try to leave no stone unturned to, to bring forward the solution. But these are the right all very return... long-term solutions. These are all very long-term solutions. A two-state solution certainly shows no signs of being agreed on overnight. What is going to happen to the 5.6 million uh, Palestinian refugees who are potentially going to be losing access to health care, education, and these basic uh, you know, human rights? 
Well, this is indeed a financial question. There need to be financial increases. I mean, the European Union is traditionally one of the biggest donors. But not uh, anymore. They... They've dropped it down. Even the UN RWA has turned around and said, even if the EU would return to last year's financing, even that would make a big difference. And the EU has so far um, said no. Well, as I said earlier, uh, this is not a, a cut in funding. This is about negotiating the conditions for uh, the 2021-2022 instalments. So if it's so not a cut in funding, what is it? The financing has, has drastically lowered. You know, uh, you, you simply don't, I mean, once again, we're speaking here about development funding, not humanitarian funding. Uh, the development funding uh, is, of course, as always, subject to a bilateral agreement between uh, those who give the money and those who receive the money. In this case, it's the Palestinian Authority. And uh, to my knowledge, negotiations are ongoing on a, a number of uh, uh, reform promises that the Palestinian Authority has been asked to uh, align to, uh, which would unblock uh, this funding from our development uh, colleagues. Uh, on the humanitarian side, uh, funding continues, has never been interrupted, and humanitarian funding is not submitted to any kind of uh, conditionality. So this is a totally different board. Well, another country in crisis continues to be Afghanistan. Now, last April, the EU pledged a fund of 525 million euros of humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. But with more restrictions from the Taliban recently announced, particularly those focused on women, how do you guarantee that EU money is not going to support extremists whose every decision so far has been against everything that Europe stands for? Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for your question because um, we, are, we are frankly disappointed with the way how things are developing in Afghanistan. You know that uh, there have been uh, a number of uh, negotiation rounds in Geneva and Doha and other places uh, between uh, Taliban representatives and representatives of the European Union, also of uh, other nations such as uh, the United States. And the Taliban, of course, have come up with a number of assurances, for example, when it comes to girls' education and women's rights. We see now that uh, many of these assurances are put into question or even formally revoked. And this, of course, uh, creates major problems. Now, uh, when it comes to humanitarian aid, and uh, rightly, um, you mentioned that um, uh, as a consequence of uh, the developments in, in Afghanistan since August last year, the international community, in particular also the European Union, have very much stepped up their humanitarian funding. Uh, we're actually speaking about a, a 1 billion pledge from the European Union for humanitarian assistance in, uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, when it comes to that kind of funding, of course, we are helped by the fact that, um, as I said earlier, we never work through governments. So we work uh, by working with local NGOs. We work with uh, the Red Crescent. We work, uh, for example, with UNICEF and other organizations. And we make sure that this money uh, comes uh, to the benefit directly of the population concerned. Uh, DG ECHO, my organization, has worked in Afghanistan uh, all, uh, uh, let's say, uh, around the years, um, uh, for 20 years, basically, uh, mostly in parts of the country that were already held by the Taliban before they took over, uh, Kabul, in August this year. So we have lots of contacts with the local representatives uh, of the Taliban, and very often this has led to, uh, to uh, let's say, uh, not only mutual recognition uh, in the sense of that one side knows what the other is doing, but also to well-established um, uh, procedures and well-established tools in order to implement aid. We don't go through the Ministry of Finance, we don't go through the central authorities in uh, Kabul, and therefore um, our aid in a way continues and has even been stepped up. We are, however, of course, affected by the, uh, by the fact that um, uh, the Taliban now do not open schools for girls and so forth, and therefore, money that we wanted to put aside, for example, for the education sector, is at this moment in time withheld, is not being used, is not being paid, um, and it will only be paid once uh, we can assure that uh, the money that we uh, use uh, can be used in a non-discriminatory way, uh, can be used for boys just as much as girls, and there is absolutely no discrimination against any kind of group of the population then we will continue with this part of aid as well. Finally, the war in Yemen is now in its eighth year, with the UN calling it the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Now, the United Nations, as well as various human rights groups, have previously criticised the Houthis for blocking the aid. But do you think they've now become more cooperative after the Ramadan ceasefire and the Riyadh agreement? Well, um, 
The situation in Yemen is uh, uh, extremely concerning, but indeed uh, the, the Ramadan uh, truce or armistice, so to say, was um, a glimpse of hope. Uh, and we hope that this creates a new logic of cooperation, uh, helped by the fact that I think all the sides to, to, to the war in Yemen, to the crisis, have understood that uh, a military solution is not easily at hand. This is not something that will come about tomorrow and that uh, can solve the problem. Uh, so there is more openness on all sides, I think, uh, uh, to uh, think about diplomatic solutions. And there's definitely more openness also to uh, let uh, space for humanitarian action. I was in Yemen two months ago. I spoke with the authorities both in Aden and in Sana'a. Um, and uh, I, I noted um, that um, wherever the international community, the donors from the United States to the UK, to the European Union, to Sweden, to Germany, uh, to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Wherever the donors speak with one voice, this one voice has an effect. For example, two years ago, the Houthis wanted to impose a 2% tax on humanitarian aid deliveries. The international community said no way. Also the World Food Program, for example, said no way. They said, if that is what you want to do, we will simply discontinue our operations in the territory that you have uh, control over. That was immediately heard, and this uh, attempt to, to tax humanitarian aid was withdrawn and has not been reintroduced. So we have uh, come up with uh, sets of criteria that we impose, that we defend, that we stand behind. And um, whenever uh, an authority, be it the Houthis or others, are in disagreement with these criteria, then unfortunately we have to rethink our engagement. Um, that has worked over the past two years. It has worked because we were able and that means the Europeans, the Swedes, the Americans, we were able basically to pull our act together and to speak with one voice, and this being heard. This being said, um, the situation in Yemen is extremely tragic. It is tragic because of a fragmentation of power. You know, you can agree something with the Minister of Social Affairs or the Prime Minister, but then in the next governorate, there's already another reality and you have to start again negotiating with the governor and the local forces. Secondly, it's a, it's a problem of uh, lack of money. Uh, you know, I went to Sana with the impression that this is the biggest food crisis in the world, and it really is. And I've seen babies starving and babies at risk of dying because of hunger. At the same time, uh, it's flabbergasting to see that the markets in Sana are overflowing with foodstuff. So the question is not uh, a shortage of foodstuff. The question is uh, a question of affordability. The people don't have the money to buy the food. Food comes in. Food comes in for those who have money to buy, but there are large parts of the population that have no money to, to buy. Uh, the public service hasn't been paid for two or three years out now. How would you want the public servant, for example, to find the money to feed his or her family? This is the problem. Uh, and unfortunately, this problem has not been solved uh, by the armistice that fortunately uh, the parties to the conflict have uh, agreed to, upon right now. And certainly with rising inflation around the world, it seems likely we're going to see even more pressure on food prices. Well, Michael Collar, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate your insights here on Frankly Speaking. Thank you very much uh, and I uh, hope to come back to you. Thank you.